Welcome to Shield of the Republic, a podcast dedicated to the proposition articulated by Walter Lippmann during World War II that U.S. foreign policy and national security policy is the shield of our democratic republic if we can keep it. Shield of the Republic is sponsored by the Bulwark and the Miller Center of Public Affairs at UVA. I'm Eric Edelman. I'm counselor at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, a non-resident fellow at the Miller Center, and a Bulwark contributor. And I'm joined by my colleague and a partner in this enterprise, Elliot Cohen. Elliot, welcome. It's uh, good to be uh, back here, and particularly with our guest this week, who's uh, somebody I have long admired. Our guest is an absolute superstar. It's Ann Applebaum, a contributor to The Atlantic, Senior Fellow of International Affairs uh, and Agora Fellow at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International uh, Studies, where Elliot and I both profess from time to time. Uh, She's a journalist and a historian. She's been an editorial and op-ed writer for The Washington Post. Uh, She's written for The Economist. She's written a Pulitzer Prize-winning history of the Gulag. She's written about the fall of the Iron Curtain and Joseph Stalin's induced famine in Ukraine. Uh, She's a member of the Board of Editors of the Journal of Democracy, and I can't think of anybody better to be with us at at this time, uh, given what's happening in the world. And welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for that lovely introduction, and it's great to be here with both of you. Let me start by something, Anne, you wrote three years ago about Putin's grand strategy. And it ended saying, at the beginning of this essay, I called Putin's tactics a grand strategy. But of course, it's really something rather different than that. It is the struggle of an autocratic and kleptocratic elite to stay in power through the resolution of crises, which it itself has created. And we should be prepared for more to come. That sounds like uh, almost to a T, uh, a description of what we have witnessed with Putin in Ukraine uh, this spring and again uh, this fall. How do you see this playing out and how do you judge the Biden administration's response uh, to what Putin has done? Has it been just about right, not enough, too much? What's your judgment? So, yes, I think it's very important to start with the realization that the crises are being created by Putin and by the Russian state. Um, You know, Putin created the crisis in 2014. He created the crisis last spring when there was a a military exercise was was, um, played out in the, right next to Ukraine, which was very threatening. Um, He's doing it again now. He's moved troops and equipment back to the borders. Um, The strange thing about about the about about this phenomenon is that it's very hard to understand how an actual invasion of Ukraine would be useful to Putin. Um, he's, uh, you, you know, the, of course he could probably get to Kiev quite quickly, but but then what? Um, he would invade Ukraine. He would occupy it. He would, you know, deal with a, a decades long or years long guerrilla war. He would subjugate the population. He would he would tolerate mass casualties. Um, Very hard to imagine that. Also very hard to imagine that that's something that would be popular in Russia. Um, The occupation of Crimea was popular in Russia, but that was bloodless. And it happened at a moment when there was no Ukrainian head of state and there was a lot of chaos. Um, That's not what would happen now. Um, And so it's hard to to see why he would want that. Um, At the same time, Putin has been saying quite clearly over and over again for many years now, and most clearly in the last few weeks, a few months, um, that he doesn't believe Ukraine is a state. Um, He wrote an essay to that effect. He had it sent to every soldier in the Russian army. Um, You know, it's it's an idea he's committed to, and he also seems somehow committed to the idea of resurrecting the Soviet empire or some version of it. Um, And he's called its collapse the um, the you know the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the twenty of the twentieth century, and there's a lot of competition for that title. So um, that means he thinks it was um, you know really bad. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, there's something strange about these repeated crises in that you know they also seem to serve domestic policy ends. Um, you know, Putin seems to need attention from the West, or particularly from the United States. Um, he has made America the center of Russian propaganda. He's made the assault and attack on American democracy, sort of the, the, the verbal assault on American democracy and on European democracy, kind of the centerpiece of modern Russian propaganda. I mean, I don't know that most Americans are aware that 
Russians hear every day, sometimes many times a day, about how degenerate Europe is, how catastrophic and disastrous America is, how terrible democracy is, how it leads to chaos and violence. Um, and that's that's a, that's a central piece of his strategy. And that is, as I as said in that essay from three years ago, that's part of um, how he intent, how he stays in power. Um, he's somebody who increasingly lacks legitimacy. Um, in the past, he was, you know, his legitimacy came from his um, his claim that he had, you know, restored some stability to Russia, that there, Russia had some economic growth. That's no longer the case. Russia's had a disastrous COVID experience. Um, the awareness of his regime's corruption and theft is pretty widespread at this point, not least thanks to the efforts of the democratic opposition in Russia. Um, and so the, the need to have a crisis with the West, to keep talking about the West, um, you know, seems to me probably the best explanation for what he's doing, um, rather than an actual intent to invade. But as I said a minute ago, you can't exclude that. Um, so given that somewhat strange set of circumstances, in other words, he seems to be, you know, threatening things in order to get attention or get, you know, some kind of engagement. Um, at the same time, we can't exclude the idea um, that he will actually do something, um, you know, given his propaganda and his rhetoric. Um, I mean, I think I would I would compliment the Biden administration for raising awareness of what's happening. Um, it's very easy, particularly for Europeans who have a lot of, you know, who trade with Russia, who are still dependent on Russian gas, um, bizarrely, actually, given, given all that's happened, um, that they haven't made greater efforts to get away from it. It's very easy for Europeans to ignore what goes on in Ukraine or what, what, what military actions the Russians make, because it's just easier to, you know, if you don't see it, if you don't acknowledge it, then you don't have to do anything about it. And I think the majority of European governments actually would, even those on Russia's borders, would prefer that. Um, and so actually, Tony Blinken um, was in Europe a few weeks ago, and he was raising the alarm. He was talking about it. Um, they've been very loud, you know, that this is unacceptable. And they have, um, you know, and I, I compliment them for doing that, because certainly the previous administration would not have done that. Um, and I don't even know if the Obama administration appreciated the degree to which these Russian threats um, might be real. Um, was it wise to engage with Putin um, and th thus give him what he wants? Um, you, know, you know, without knowing the details of the conversation, that's a little harder for me to say. Um, so they did have a, there was a meeting and a conversation and it was, you know, it was the central news on Russian television for many days, although less so in the United States. Um, and that was, of course, a, that was what Putin wanted. Um, I mean, it, it, at least publicly, the um, both you know both National Security Council officials and and the press conferences after the event have said, you know, the United States will not give in to any Russian red lines, and we're going to not going to make any promises about Ukraine, and all that sounds right to me. Um, I still slightly worry um, that simply because this isn't the crisis that the Biden administration wants, they're not interested in having a fight with Russia that they will, you know, in the coming days and weeks, be tempted to continue this somewhat pointless dialogue. Again, this is a crisis created by Russia. Why should we be resolving it? I mean, there's nothing to resolve. You know, the, the answer to the crisis is that Russia should withdraw. Um, and I worry the Biden administration will get dragged into that, you know, just kind of diplomatic inertia, and they'll keep talking, and, um, and the Russians will keep using that for propaganda. Um, and I hope that at some point, they'll be able to cut it off. And then, of course, the other piece of the story that we don't really know is the degree of um, American military support for Ukraine. There has been some there. You know, this is, as you remember, this was the cause of the first impeachment crisis in the Trump administration. It was the military equipment that we had promised to Ukraine and that Trump was inclined to not deliver. Um, but we have there there has been there have been military to military contacts with Ukraine. There has been there have been at least some weapons delivered. Um, and it is thought, as I understand from experts, that there are at least a part of the Ukrainian army is now well armed and very ready to fight and will actually fight. Um, and so the, the you know, what really matters, you know, in the long term is deterrence. Can, do we have. Have we supported Ukraine sufficiently to deter some kind of mad invasion? Um, and of course, it will take some nerves of steel to provide that deterrence because the Russians will keep shouting about how it's aggressive, how it's, 
you know, aimed at them um, and a constant repetition that no, this is not about attacking Russia. This is about defending Ukraine. Um, you know, making clear, you know, we sell weapons to a lot of people. We can sell weapons to Ukraine too, if we feel like it. Um, making clear that we have the right to do that and Ukraine has the right to defend itself are going to be really important things to keep stating over and over again down the road. And I hope that the Biden administration will do that loudly. Um, you know, they haven't, they haven't wanted to emphasize that piece of the puzzle so far, but I hope they will in the future. Before I kick it over to Elliot, let me just pull on on that string that you've just pulled out here about uh, the Biden administration's response and your concerns about, you know, continuing the dialogue with Russia. There are two things that have made me a little concerned. One is the discussion, rather loose discussion of, quote, finding, as the president said, some accommodation with Russia, finding a different group of countries uh, to discuss this with when there are already venues that the Russians have agreed to. There's a NATO-Russia council. There's the OSCE. They're perfectly fine venues to discuss this. Why we need to invent a new one to propitiate Putin, I'm not at all clear on. And a story that NBC had the other day that there is a $200 million package of assistance to Ukraine that's being held up by the Biden administration for fear of, of offending Putin somehow or provoking Putin. You know, I voted for Joe Biden on the uh, you know, assurance that unlike the previous administration, you know, assistance to Ukraine wasn't going to be held up. Uh, for political reasons. So, I mean, I find all of those things concerning, and in particular, the accommodation language, uh, which raises, you know, all of the neuralgias that you well know um, Central Europeans have about discussions about us without us. Yeah, let me actually, let me just add add to that, Eric, uh, the yeah, idea of having a meeting without the Ukrainians present. You know, that does have, there are overtones of the Munich crisis uh, in that, where you know, the country that's actually under pressure, or under attack, is kind of told to sit outside and wait for the big boys to decide what their fate will be. That's a, if I were Ukrainian, I think that'd be very unsettling, but in any case, it just strikes me as a very bad precedent. Yeah, I mean, the, so the, the so again, I, I, I'm, the reason I'm a little ambivalent is because again, the Biden administration did consult both with the Ukrainians and with some other European allies before the call. The call. Right. Um, and there was a very clear statement on a kind of press call before the call, also that we are not giving into any red lines and there will be no accommodation. I mean, whatever, le you know, and that's why I'm not really sure what this language means about, and, and, you know, it may be that someone in the Biden administration has said, well, if we, if we, if we, you know, if we offer some bogus diplomacy, then they'll, sh you know, that's what they really want and they'll shut up. Um, that is better than offering them, you know, Kiev, you know, um, and there has been, there have been a couple of voices in the American sort of foreign policy community who have said, let's let them have Kiev if they want Kiev, um, because then they'll be satisfied with that, which that, which really sounds like um, the 1930s. Um, and so nobody, you know, nobody has, nobody has said, you know, has, there's no threat so far of the territorial integrity of Ukraine. But yes, I mean, it's a little ambivalent. One would like some clearer language. The language has been you know, not not just unclear, but slightly different in different contexts. But they sound kind of tough off the record, and they sound less tough in public. Um, I, you know, I don't know whether that's with the maybe mistaken belief that they can, you know, make the Russians calm down if they say things like that. And you know, I, I don't know. But you're right. I would I would like something. I would like more clarity than there has been. Let me ask you a, a somewhat different question, Anne. You know, as I listen to your descrip description of Putin's motives. In your analysis, as in the analysis of a lot of other people, there are really two strands. One is corrupt, kleptocratic, obsessed with maintaining his own power and with personal gain to the extent that at, the, at this point that matters, given how many billions he probably has squirreled away. On, on the other hand, there is, um, if if one could put it this way, a, a sincere, I suppose, ideological commitment or a set of beliefs that Ukraine is not simply, simply not a legitimate country, that it belongs as part of Russia, and that he, Putin, has a historical mission, which is to restore Russia as a European great power. And, you know, those two can coexist. But I wonder if you could give us, help us understand what's the nature of the balance between them. And I'll throw out a hypothesis to you, and I'd be really curious to know what you th make of it, which is that the older he gets, they both become more important because he he's, as you say, there are limited number of domestic accomplishments he can point to. And they've been taking a battering from COVID. 
But I would argue that that sense of history with a capital H and his mission in it probably becomes more and more important to him. And that helps explain behavior, which is in many ways counterproductive. I mean, I, I'll defer to your expertise on this, but it seems to me that whatever Ukrainians used to think about Russia, it is nowhere near as positive now. In fact, in some ways, what he's helping to do is helping to cultivate a Ukrainian sense of national identity as distinct from and indeed opposed to Russian nationality. And so he's made his own problem at some level worse. So that's a lot of stuff I'm thrown at you. I'd be curious to know what your reaction is. No, so, I mean, you're right. I mean, and this is one of the great paradoxes. I mean, in a way, the whole thing starting in 2014 and getting increasing to the present has been a kind of own goal. I mean, if the point is to reabsorb Ukraine, Putin has had, you know, his actions have had exactly the opposite effect. Um, Ukraine is now more consolidated as a nation and as a state than it was before. Um, one interesting statistic is that every year more Ukrainians, so just to be clear, U Ukraine is a bilingual state where everybody speaks Ukrainian and Russian. Everybody does. Um, but more and more every year, people more people describe their native tongue as Ukrainian, which simply means that more people identify firstly with that language and with that you know, that sense of culture, cultural identity. I mean, there are plenty of Russian speaking Ukrainians who are also Ukrainians, but nevertheless, they claim the Ukrainian language um, more and more. And you have a, a you know, ever clearer sense of, of national identity that wasn't there before. Um, you know, you and one of the results of that is you have a better military than you used to have. You have a, you know, better economy actually at the moment than you used to have. I mean, it's also been damaged by COVID, but Ukraine was um, has been doing a lot better in in, in recent years, um, and you know so so um, you know so Putin's you know activities had exactly the opposite effect of what you would expect, um, you know. And I mean, as I said, but at the same time, I think your observation about him aging. I mean, to which I would add that he is also much more cut off from people than he was before, and this is again partly COVID. Um, you know, he's surrounded now mostly by security guards. Um, he has much less contact with other kinds of Russians than he used to do. Um, you know, there used to be, you know, in Moscow, there were sort of leaks from Putin's entourage that you could hear and people had been to see him or there was a conversation. So you don't really hear that anymore. So we don't really know what he's thinking. Um, uh, and he's much more cut off. Um, and he, he, he may now be, you know, worried about some... You know, as, you know, as you say, some kind of legacy or some kind of big thing he needs to do in order to in order to stay in power, um, you know, and, th and all that makes him more dangerous. Um, you know, it's the it's this element of irrationality. I mean, if he was a if he was calculating rationally, he would, first of all, not be doing what he's doing because it increases Ukrainian national identity. And second of all, he wouldn't do it because, as I said, the you know it's interesting. The war in Crimea was popular. The occupation of Crimea, I should say, was popular in Russia. But the war in Donbass, which has gone on and on and produced casualties, is not popular. Um, and there's not even that much written about it in Russia. They don't hear about it much. And I just don't see that a big bloody war with Ukraine is going to help Putin. Um, and so that's also irrational. But you have to take into account when you're dealing with someone like him that he may now be more irrational than he used to be. Um, he may be more worried about staying in power. He may be older and more worried about his, you know, weird idea of legacy. Um, he may have lost more touch with reality um, than than he did in the than he was in the past. You know, to, to perhaps it'll foreshadow our discussion a bit about uh, the autocrats and why they're winning. But I mean, Eric, given your expertise on Turkey, I have to say, I've, there's been part of me that's been thinking something similar about Erdogan. As he gets on in years, maybe is not in the best of health. That's that's never been clear. And and just that, what happens, I think, to anybody in power, but certainly in autocracies, where the circle narrows, you hear less and less dissent. You think more and more about your place in uh, history. I mean, we may encounter something like this with Xi Jinping. We may already be encountering it. And I think you're going to have a whole bunch of them simultaneously going through this. The last thing I'd just point out is uh, not, not to resort to the argument ad Hitlerum, which is always a bad argument. But if you remember when Hitler's talking to his generals in 1938, and he's kind of laying out when he thinks they need to move, part of it is driven by his own sense of mortality and his feeling that he is, doesn't have, you know, 
several decades ahead of him, he may have one to accomplish his historical mission. And, you know, that's kind of worrisome. Well, both of them have a huge succession problem. I mean, you know, Putin needs to find a Putin uh, to whom he can turn over power because otherwise he is, you know, very vulnerable. Erdogan has exactly the same problem. You know, this is probably a good point and to turn to the larger context in which this whole Putin-Ukraine crisis is playing out, which is the larger confrontation between authoritarian and democratic regimes, which I think is in many quarters an unacknowledged important part of this return of great power competition. This is not just merely sort of, you know, great powers jostling for advantage in the international system. There is an ideological uh, dimension to this. And you've written uh, about this and and talked about why the bad guys are winning. And you've talked about your own experience with uh, the democratic recession in in East uh, Central Europe. why do you think the bad guys are winning? What's what's allowing them to you know seize a march on democracy when twenty years ago we all thought that you know the democracy was the unstoppable wave of the future? It would you know mark the end of history, etc. So the so the bad guys are winning was a cover story that I wrote in the Atlantic that was published um, a few weeks ago, um, and really the the thesis of that was that. Actors like Putin, even Xi, Erdogan, um, throw in the Belarusians, the Venezuelans, the Cubans, um, you know, even the even the the the, the junta in Myanmar, um, no longer act on their own, or if they, um, or to be more specific, they cooperate and collaborate with one another in ways that actually in the in the past might have seemed strange, you know. You have regimes that have sort of theoretically very different ideologically. I don't know what you call Putinism, right wing nationalism, um, plus, you know, Venezuelan, Bolivarian communists, socialists. You have Chinese communists. You have Iranian theocrats, all of whom actually now operate in some very similar ways and have begun to help one another. Um, Because all of them perceive in the way that, like Putin, all of them perceive democracy both as an idea and as a reality as a threat to them personally. Um, and and the way they cooperate is also a little bit different from in the past. You know, it's not just kind of, I don't know, their mil- you know, East German military advisors going to tell people how to set up their own KGBs. It's more, it's on, it's on a number of levels. Um, it's on the level of companies. So these kind of quasi-state, quasi-private companies that you find in, in, in Russia or China, you know, invest in one another's deals. They help one another out. Um, they use the same, um, you know, disinformation tactics, which they share. I mean, the Russians invented a whole way of doing disinformation, which has then been adopted by others. Um, and in some cases adopted by political parties in the democratic world as well. Um, they take advantage of loopholes in the international financial system to steal and launder and, use money to buy political influence, both inside their own countries, but also abroad. Um, And they all use these very similar avenues and tactics, um, and they use them both to keep themselves in power and to keep one another in power. So you have the phenomenon of the, the, not only the Russians propping up the Belarusian regime, which is a very weak regime and very unpopular. Um, You have the Russians propping them up, but also the biggest Chinese investment in Europe is in Belarus. Um, you know, the Cubans speak up for the Belarusians in, in the UN. Um, very similar situation in Venezuela, actually, where, you know, the Venezuelan regime is now propped up, again, by Russian, Chinese, Iranian, um, Turkish investment, um, you know, which would, which would be all, again, ideologically nuts. I mean, unthinkable groups of countries working together to keep Maduro's narco state in power. But um, but they do it because they all see they all have, in fact, one thing in common, which is that they all feel threatened by the same kinds of democracy movements. And they all feel threatened also by the rule of law, um, um, language and reality of of the Western world. Um, And the the imbalance, of course, is that the West hasn't seen this or hasn't wanted to see this. And I say the West broadly, actually, I should I should use the expression the democratic world rather than the West, because I include Asian democracies and Latin American democracies, too. the democratic world hasn't really seen this as a, as a threat. Um, you know, these are countries that we all do business with. Um, we all have very complicated, elaborate relationships with them, especially China, but not only. Um, 
you know, the, the, the kleptocratic loopholes that they make use of are the ones that we created and we also use or our, our bankers, you know, have facilitated. Um, and the and the disinformation tactics that the Russians and others invented have been um, used by, you know, parties and democracies as well, including the Republican Party in the 2016 election. And then you could even argue they're still using some version of that. Um, now, you know, this kind of use of deep polarization and um, the deliberate creation of false reality. This is a, you know, famous Putinist tactic. So, so, so what I'm saying is that the, you know, they, they have been pushing back against democracy very consistently. We haven't seen it as a problem. And on the contrary, we have used some of those tactics ourselves, or we have allowed them to be imported into our politics. I mean, in a way, I suppose it's kind of the flip side of globalization. Um, you know, globalization brought many good things and positive trade and contact between people and the spread of technology and, you know, you know, prosperity. I mean, it had, it had many good sides, but the downside is that a the autocracies have just as much influence inside our countries as we have in theirs, maybe sometimes more. Um, and also that the um, the loosening of you know, financial regulations around the world have made possible these, you know, kleptocratic activities that 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 have have benefited bad actors in the United States as well. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you know, most much of Donald Trump's the latter part of his career was enabled by his, you know, the 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 the, the, the Russian and other oligarchs who bought uh, properties within his buildings, mostly anonymously. Um, including during his presidency, you know there were shell people, sh shell companies were buying property, buying apartments in Trump properties. We still don't know whose shell companies they were. We don't know if those, you know, those purchases were, were bribes or what kind of influence they were. The people who bought them were hoping to get on the president. Um, and so, you know, we now have, in, you know, we we kind of co-created this world and we are influenced by it. Um, and I am, I think that is. It's not the only explanation for the weakening of democracy in many places, but it's a part of it. Um, the you know the rise in you know both as both as kind of counterexamples, and this is particularly true of China, and particularly China China versus the developing world. China can say, look, we're we're offering you an alternate model of development, but also as sources of influence, sources of financial influence, sources of you know. Um, you know, tactical influences, as I said, sources of disinformation, um, the autocracies have been really active inside our societies. And we are just now really waking up to this. Um, I worry sometimes in the United States that we're going to overfocus on China um, just because it's a some kind of easy enemy. But really, it's not China. It's the it's the autocratic world. It's China plus Iran plus Russia um, plus, you know, a host of smaller powers um, who now all act in very similar ways. Um, and the, I, the, the notion that we need both some internal reforms in order to fight this and a foreign policy um, that can unite, you know, the, the, the remaining democracies with the democratic movements around the world. And I would include the Hong Kong movement, the Venezuelans, the Belarusians and others, um, that we need that as a way to push back both, you know, really, but also ideologically against this creeping autocracy and creeping kleptocracy. Um, I think we're a little bit late to that party. I mean, some people do now get it. And I think that was the purpose of Biden's democracy summit in Washington. Um, but it's, you know, it's all happening very slowly and maybe a little bit too late. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, there's also an element of sheer technique to all this. You know, if you look at even things like the how people put down crowds that gather and demonstrations and so on, uh, there's no comparison between, say, how the Shah dealt with the crowds that were demonstrating against him with how the Iranian government dealt uh, with the equally large crowds that you had in 2009 on the streets. And it's not just that they're supporting each other, which they are, uh, as you say, and doing business with each other, as you say. There's also there's kind of a technique of repression, and that's now increasingly diffuse. And I, what I would 
I guess I would suggest too, is that you're going to need the kind of technique of democratic dissent and subversion and mobilization, which once upon a time we actually did. I mean, if you think about what we did, say, with solidarity in uh, Poland, you know, we were doing things like supplying modems and so on so that people could communicate behind the backs of the... It was pre- pre-modem, actually. We supplied them with Xerox machines. And Xerox, Xerox machines, too. <laughs> and typewriters. Okay. But, but you know, there are, there are unquestionably the contemporary equivalents of those kinds of things. And, you know, we probably should be investing in figuring out how we get those out there to people who can use them. Because, you know, and you've, you've written quite a bit about this. It, what's quite striking is if you look at a place like Belarus or Russia, or for that matter, Iran or indeed China, it, it's not that there's a shortage of people who hate this and are unwilling to expose themselves to considerable hazard to oppose it. Um, I agree with that. I mean, and, you know, kind of getting the, you know, the support for democracy movements off the back foot where it is now, you know, in that we, we help people in small ways and beginning to think on much bigger scale, you know, you know, what is the answer to Russian disinformation? You know, why don't we have a, you know, Russian language television that can provide an answer to um, Putin's television, which is actually watched all over Russian speaking Europe, which is a lot of people, including 4 million people in Germany or 3 million people in Germany. So, um, you know, why haven't we come up with some answers to that? How do we push back against the, you know, we, we have these little projects, you know, we have we're in a really very brave, small group of Uyghur language journalists, and we have, um, you know, brave people who work for Radio Free Asia and, you know, in China, but it's, it's tiny when you compare it to the scale of Chinese propaganda and communications. Um, and we really haven't scaled up our efforts either there or really in thinking about how we build greater resilience at home to these kinds of tactics. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're way behind in thinking about how to better run the internet, by which I don't mean censoring the internet, but I mean, um, you know, having some alternative forms of social media that actually promote civilized conversation rather than um, emotion and anger or, um, you know, or looking at the regulation of algorithms, um, you know, so that they promote that kind of, you know, better, better conversation rather than worse conversation. Um, you know, we're way behind on that. Um, and we're behind on um, on corruption and kleptocracy. I mean, there there has been a little bit of progress made in that area, and actually, that was one of the things that the Biden administration did um, draw attention to in connection to the democracy summit was some steps that have been taken to close some of those loopholes, you know. And that's good, but we need the, that kind of commitment from everybody. We need it from the Germans. We need it from the people, good people of Liechtenstein, and um, we need it from. Um, from all of our allies around the world, some kind of commitment to stop laundering money and stop using, letting kleptocratic money distort all of our economies. Um, and so, and so the, 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 the scale of the change, the scale of the foreign policy shift, and even the scale of some part of the domestic policy shift, I just, I don't think we've really reckoned with yet the, what, you know, what needs to be done. Yeah, the Biden administration announcing a strategy for countering corruption and categorizing it, in fact, as strategic corruption, I think is is a, a step ahead. I mean, as you point out, we have you know a lot to do in our own house to to sort of uh, not only make ourselves more resilient, but put ourselves on a footing, as you say, to scale up our efforts. But that really does raise the question of the state of our own democracy, uh, which you've also written about, and you've just in in some of your comments with us today adverted to the problem of having at least one of our two political parties, uh, in large measure, um, becoming a party that is open to sort of authoritarianism if it isn't already an authoritarian cult of personality. What's your take? And we've just had some very dramatic developments in the last 24 hours, which has been the um, January 6th committee voting and sending to the full house a referral, criminal referral for contempt of Congress to for Mark Meadows, uh, but they've done it in a way that also spells out a lot of what was actually going on in much more detail uh, and with much more granularity than I think we've had before in the White House in the run-up to the insurrection on January 6th. 
And what's your overall take on the state of American democracy? You've written about this quite a bit as well. And, and what, what do you see as the prospects for pulling away from this authoritarian temptation that at least one party seems to be subject to? Um, so I, do, I think you're right. I mean, the, what's happening inside the Republican Party is frightening. And it's frightening not because people don't know what happened. Um, you know, my my sense is that a large part, certainly if we're talking about the Republicans in Congress, a large part of them do know what happened. They knew at the time that President Trump was seeking to overthrow the results of the election. They knew that Joe Biden had won legitimately. Um you know, some of them were going along with Trump. Some of them were ignoring what was happening in order to, with the hopes it would go away. Um, and since then, they've doubled their efforts in trying to deny that anything was happening. And of course, the use of this commission is that it um, it brings the contrast between their panic on the day of January the 6th um, and their, you know, the sort of subsequent cover up. It makes that even even clearer. Um, you know, I mean, the decline of a of, of, a, of one political party is something that's happened in other countries. I mean, I'm, I'm in Warsaw right now talking to you and it's happened here. We have one, um, you know, I mean, here, I'm, you know, unfortunately it's the ruling party, which has um, become ever more authoritarian and um, has begun also breaking rules and, you know, distorting the, you know, political climate um, for its own benefit here. So it's not, it's not an unknown pro problem. I and mean, I think in America, um, you know, a little bit like it's been hard to get people to pay attention to the rise of autocracy. It's been very hard to get Americans to understand that one of their political parties is is no longer no longer believes in American democracy or no longer wants to support the voting system, or at least it's willing to be um, complicit in allowing a part of the party to 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 just to to, to undermine. Um, our system and our, our faith in our institutions. Um, you know, it's hard to believe that it's true. And I think if you ask, I think I saw some polling recently that showed that most Democrats don't believe that, meaning, meaning Democratic voters, Democratic Party voters, don't believe that democracy is in crisis. Um, you know, they were convinced that the election of Biden solved the problem. Um, and I'm afraid that's not true. Um, you know, the... You know, the difficulty is that if you, again, if you look at history and if you look around the world, the solution to this problem almost certainly has to come at least in part from within the Republican Party. Um, so it will have to come from authorities inside the party or inside the whatever we call it. And they're not really conservatives anymore, but within the what we used to call the conservative community, whether it's religious leaders or business leaders or journalists or with a lot with big platforms or or politicians, it's going to have to come from them. They will have to push back against um, you know against this you know anti democratic, really actually anti American force that's now taken over the party. And of course, there the numbers of people who are willing to do that is just vanishingly small. I mean, right now it's basically Liz Cheney and Adam Kinsinger. Um, and on and, a good know, day, Mitt Romney. Two, on a good day, Mitt Romney, but not reliably, you know, I don't know, maybe Susan Collins or Lisa Murkowski would vote one way or the other, you know, but but they aren't vocal um, and they aren't um, and they aren't really contributing to the to the to the to the necessary, um, you know, delegitimization of the Trumpists, um, you know, and so, you know, it is it is my hope that they'll continue to do that and that slowly they'll and that's, of course, what they hope is that they'll slowly begin to get more um, more support. Um, but it's you know, it's going to be a long road. And of course, the dangerous thing is we're a two party system. They're the um, you know, they're the opposition party. It's very likely that in 2022 or 2024, they can win again. Um, and the danger is that when they win, they start behaving like the law and justice party in Poland or like Fidesz in Hungary and they begin to alter the political system so that they can't lose again. Um, and to some extent, that's already happening and that there are these attempts to rig the voting system and to gerrymander the voting system and so on so that um, so that they can't lose. They're, they're trying to do it even while they're out of power. Um, and the difficulty is going to be in raising awareness so that enough Americans know and care. I think both uh, Eric and I... Uh... Agree with you. We've got a between us a few of the scars from those battles. And one of the problems in the United States is intellectuals actually can't do very much about this, I think, without 
you know, real politicians leading the charge. I, I wanted to actually use this to, to pivot, uh, if we could. You know, as Eric said in the uh, the introduction, you're a terrific journalist, but you're also a deep historian. And I thought it might be interesting if we could explore a little bit how you came to be where you are, not not your career progression necessarily, but talk a little bit about intellectual influences, the kinds of things that have, and the kinds of people that have shaped your your view of the world. And then maybe we could also, if we have time, talk a little bit about an issue that the three of us have shared in common, which is what happens when some of the people who you thought were your comrades in arms turn out not to be. Mm, yes. I mean, it, it, I suppose, that, you know, for me, the most important thing that happened to me, my most important influential it, sort of, I wasn't, it wasn't an intellectual influence. It was a kind of life experience was the experience of being in Warsaw in 1988 and 89 and watching communism collapse. Um, I was a very young journalist. Um, I was a kind of stringer freelancer. I was writing for The Economist and for some British newspapers. Um, and, um, you know, watching a, the system end and a new system be born in the 90s was, um, you know, shaped me in all kinds of ways. I mean, it's a, it, was a, it was a kind of lesson in how politics really works. Um, and... In, in, you know, it may even have misled me because um, I was so convinced by the power of um, democratic language and by the strength of, and also by the pull of existing institutions, whether it was the European Union or NATO, you know, which, which you know, the instant that the Poles weren't part of the Warsaw Pact anymore, the first thing they wanted to do was join everything in the West. Um, because those were seen as the, you know, the institutions that were the best, and that's what everybody wanted to be part of. Um, and, you know, that that is, you know, there's clearly now a lot of doubt about those institutions, and there's clearly a lot of doubt about whether, you know, democracy works and whether it's fair and whether it was, um, you know, it's not so much doubt in Poland about democracy, but doubt more broadly, as we've just been discussing about democracy. So, so I might even have been misled by my experience into thinking that these ideas were more powerful than they sometimes are. Um, I don't know. I mean, as a, as a journalist, very in, in the last few days, someone both of you know died, um, who was a really important mentor of mine, Fred Hyatt, who was the op-ed editor of the Washington Post and sort of editorial page editor. And I worked for him for about four years in sort of between 2000 and 2004. Um, as an editorial writer and his sense of, you know, it's his sense of fairness of the need to show different points of view and to tolerate different points of view on his page made it a little bit different from other editorial pages in the country. Um, and, but at the same time, that was clearly possible because of his dedication to the American constitution, to the ideals of rule of law, and again, to the ideas of democracy, which he also supported. He, you know, he was a real spokesman for democratic movements around the world. I mean, that was an illustration of how you could, as a journalist, try to embody those ideas and ideals. And so I think he was, he was, um, he was very influential on, you know, in, in terms of showing me how you could do that as a journalist. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that I always lived up to that, but that's, at least in theory, um, what I'd like to be. You know, I know Eric and I periodically talk about John McCain. We wonder, are there going to be more John McCains? Uh, and if so, where might they come from? And I wonder, do you, what's your expectation? Will there be more Fred Hyatt's or was he to some extent the product of a particular moment in history growing up during the Cold War, uh, as we all did, uh, and sort of seeing a conflict between freedom and totalitarianism? Well, and, and, and and Fred, like me, Fred was a correspondent in Moscow in the yeah. early '90s. So Fred, Fred also had that same experience of of watching democratic change try to ha you know it was didn't quite succeed in Russia, but there was a moment when it felt like yeah. it was possible. Um, and so Fred was very influenced like that. And I think there's a generation of journalists actually. You could include me. You could include Jackson Deal. You could include several others. Um, you know, even David Remnick, you know, you could include lots of people who, who had that formative experience and, and um, you know, will people who are 20 or 30 years younger have that? No. Um, I don't think it means that, um, you know, younger people won't rediscover the appeal of the same ideas and ideals, because ultimately it's very hard to see how you run 
particularly American society without them. Um, and so I, I imagine we'll, people will eventually return to them. But there is right now a lot of, um, what's the word? There's a lot of skepticism about American democracy. Um, not all, you know, on the right, you have a violent rejection of it. On the left, there's a lot of skepticism and doubt about it um, and a, and an unwillingness to defend some of the core principles, which also worries me. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I don't know who's going to be the next editor of the Washington Post editorial page, but I, I you know, of course, I, I do hope it's someone who is in at least that same tradition. Let me ask you one thing, Anne, about your writing. It strikes me. I mean, before you brought, you know, the journalist flair that you have to the, you know, to these, you know, histories of very difficult subjects, um, the gulag, the Sovietization of uh, East Central Europe after World War II, the, the famine in Ukraine. Um, you brought a kind of historical depth to your reporting in your very first book, uh, you know, from from east to west, uh, which I remember reading. I mean, it came out just as I was the deputy chief of mission in in Prague, and I found as I read it, it was very resonant because it had all this sort of historical depth to contemporary reportage. And you still do that, I think, in a lot of your essays in uh, in the Atlantic. And where did that come from? You know, not all journalists obviously bring that to the table. A lot of them are merely telling you, you know, just the facts, ma'am, you know, who, what, where, when. There are a lot of good journalists out there, but, but um, no, so I, I was a, I was a, I studied history as an undergraduate at Yale. And as you know, I think um, we had a, a professor in common, Wolfgang Leonard, or who, he was, he was, I went to his lectures. I, he, I didn't know him personally, but the, you know, the, 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 I mean, funny enough, my, to be, you know, more precise than, than, than really matters. I was actually a double major in history and literature. Um, and so I, I do think that a lot of time spent reading old books um, was, was part of, you know, it's what, it's part of what drew me to the region of Eastern Europe because it's so complicated and figuring it out and trying to understand it and trying to understand the mythology almost requires you to read fiction as well as, as well as study history. Um, and so, you know, the, the attraction of it was precisely the, you know, the magical realism aspects of, of, of life in, of life in Ukraine. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think this, the study of history and the study of languages and the study of, um, uh, of, of, of literature were all, um, you know, I, I was really a journalist because of that as much as anything else. I mean, I, I also wanted to you know, I don't know, it sounds too pretentious, but, um, you know, I, I wanted to have, I wanted to write literature of my own or something like that. Old books. I think uh, uh, Eric and I can sign up for that one too. <laughs> Our guest today has been Anne Applebaum. We've been delighted to have her. It's been a great conversation, Anne. We could go on for hours on all of these subjects. And uh, given the fact that uh, the authoritarian international that you've described is not going away anytime soon, um, but seems more likely to be a, a condition of international life going forward. I hope we can have you back uh, sometime in the future uh, to join us again. But thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. It was a great conversation. We'll do it again. And, and thanks to both of you. Thank you very much for being a dedicated listener of Shield of the Republic. We're growing at a rapid pace and hope to continue this trend. If you've been enjoying the podcast, please give it a five-star rating and write a review. It'll help us spread the word and get others to listen in to Shield of the Republic.